so the topic of my lecture is also on nuclear power, and it's on primarily devoted to thorium, which is the, an alternate fuel cycle that can be used to generate nuclear energy. Um, thorium you hear a lot about in the news lately, um, and there's a lot of articles written about all the advantages of thorium. Um, one of the things that's commonly cited is there's four times as much thorium in the world as uranium. And then they have all sorts of claims that it's safer, it can't melt down, so it's not going to jump out of its can and get us all. The, um, there's, it supposedly solves the nuclear waste problem, and um, apparently you can't make nuclear weapons about, out of it. And so that's what you get from reading the articles. And um, some of those things are a bit exaggerated, but it is a very good form of fuel. Um, First, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fission in general, because I know that not everybody here may be quite up on that. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the basics of fissions and nuclear reactors in general. So your basic um, fission reaction is you have a, you have a fissile nucleus. Um, in this case of this scheme, it's uranium. And you hit that with a neutron. And it flies apart, and you generate two pieces. Um, and you release a bunch of energy and also more neutrons. And those neutrons go out and they may hit another neutron, uranium atom or they may hit something else and be absorbed and so the thing goes on. And um, you get released a lot of heat in the process and then you just use the heat like ordinary in the, in the thermal plant. The only naturally occurring fissile nucleus is uranium-235. and and then there are the other two things that occur in nature that are useful in this process are thorium-232 and uranium-238, which is most of uranium. And so, I explained this earlier, and the only, and the, the amount of uranium-235 you have is 0.72% of the uranium. And we typically enrich this to th about around 3.5%, it varies a little bit with the reactor, in order to run it in the power plants. Um, here's a little bit about uh, the amount of uranium usage in the world. Um, in 2010, we used 64,000 metric, 64, metric tons to produce um, 2.6 million gigawatt hours of electricity. And um, if, of course, people don't look for uranium they don't need, so the, this number grows every year. This is the amount of known uranium resources that we can recover at less than $260 per kilogram, which works out to less than 0 .6, 0 0.6 cents per kilowatt hour for the fuel. And of course, this number is a little bit um, fictitious because, for instance, it rose 12% in the previous year because people obviously do not search for uranium they don't need. But we have a 100 years supply readily at hand. Okay, this, and this is a little more about the chain reaction. Each neutron used must generate one more net neutron. Um, and so you have to, this, in a reactor, this has to be exactly right. Each preceding generation must have the same number of neutrons as the preceding generation. And we call this the K multiplication factor K, um, as described there. Most nuclear reactors built are what we, you call a thermal reactor. Um, the neutron, when it is, pops out of the nucleus, has very high energy. And it's practical to, to, to moderate the neutron, to slow it down. You, that's typically done with hydrogen or deuterium or carbon. And the neutron bounces around in that until it slows down to the Boltzmann distribution of energies. And then it then the nuclear cross-sections are higher at that energy, and so then you create the fission events. And then we the reactor is controlled by um, a number of means. You typically, you have control rods at the top, which you put in, or at the bottom in case of PWRs, and, you, um, and they um, absorb neutrons, and so you adjust those to keep the neutron population the way you want it. And um, then, of course, in order to have a safe reactor, you need to have a negative feedback. So that in the short term, if you raise the temperature of the reactor, the reactivity goes down so the thing doesn't get away from you. And this is a, a 
painting of the Chicago Pile, which was the first operating nuclear um, chain react reactor. And then here's your basic, this is a common schematic of a pressurized water reactor power plant. You have the core here, you have a primary coolant flowing around, um, the pressurizer keeps everything at about 2,000 psi. This goes through a steam generator, um, which heats the, st heats the steam up to a, to a nice hot temperature, and it goes to the turbine, and you produce energy, and it goes out in the grid and turns on the city lights. So um, that's the basic reactor, and there's about 100 of those in the country today, as most of you are well aware. A thorium reactor is a type of breeder reactor. And a breeder reactor is, is um, different. In a regular reactor, what you do is you just you take uranium out of the ground, you purify it, um, and you um, enrich it. And you get, and in some reactors you don't require enrichment like uh, the can-do reactors, but you enrich it, you put it in the reactor, and then you uh, burn it up. And when it's, raised, when it's done, you take it out and you put in fresh fuel. And you can put the fuel aside, and you can, and sometimes it's depending upon the price of uranium, it's practical to reprocess that, and get it, you can get a few more percent out because of the, the fission products stop the reaction before you run out of uranium. In a breeder reactor, instead of running out of fuel, you actually make fuel within the re reactor. Um, there's two cycles which are of practical interest. The first is uh, you is you have uranium-238, and you hit it with a neutron, and you create uranium-239, and that decays down to plutonium-239, which is also fissile. And then you can run your reaction off of plutonium. The other thing you can do is use thorium, and um, you do a similar reaction. You get uranium-233, which you then use as the fuel. And the dis the, uh, in order to have a breeder cycle keep going, you have to have enough neutrons to not only keep your reaction going, but also um, make the next atom of fuel required. And here is, a, here is the, an eta plot showing the number of neutrons born per neutron, per um, the um, energy of the neutron population in the reactor. And um, as you can see, at the um, at thermal, these are the thermal energies where most of the nuclear power plants in the countries operate. Um, you um, have slightly above two neutrons come out of the reactor per come out of the per um, fission event, and so one of those neutrons has to go back into making the um, keeping the reaction going and create another fission. In order to have to keep the breeder cycle going, you have to have a whole other neutron to make new fuel. And then you have to have a little bit more because some of it's lost. Um, you, it leaks out. You, there's some self-absorption that's not. And, um, and so in the thermal energy range, the only one that is really practical is uranium-233 from 232. You can also make an, a perfectly good breeder reactor using plutonium. And as you can see, the, at higher energies, you get more neutrons, and so the neutron economy increases, and so you can make a fast breeder reactor, too, which works, which they have done quite successfully. And, um, and this is a summary of what I just said. Um, thorium breeder reactors produce a small amount of uranium-232. It's uh, about uh, half a percent. And this is advertised as the proliferation resistance of thorium. It's actually not quite true. It's not really an ironclad thing because you can make a perfectly good bomb out of uranium-233. And what uranium-232 does is it, it has a very, its decay chain has a very um, high energy gamma ray coming out of it. And it's got a fairly short half right. So the theory is that it will be, um, that it's dangerous to handle, and that you can just handle it remotely. So it's, it's a little bit harder. It's also a little bit easier to detect because uh, the, your bomb would be radioactive. But it's, it's, it's a fairly small deal. And so, 
Thorium, here's a picture of some menazite sand I got off the internet. It's the 90th element, it's got a density of about 12, and it is, it's about three to four times as common as uranium. It's, primary, it's often found in monazite sand, of which India has a very large amount. That's why they're very interested in thorium, because they have lots of thorium and not much uranium. So if they want to be self-sufficient in that respect, they could use thorium. Um, there's two ways you can run a thorium cycle. One is with a, uh, an open uh, an open cycle, I guess, is you take the you take the thorium in the reactor, and you have a you have to start out with a uranium reactor, or you could start out with plutonium, and you um, have the uh, have the thorium mixed in with the fuel, and then as the reaction goes, you make more fuel, and then you just keep you can keep it going. The problem with that is you also gain fission products as you. Um, go along, so it's sometimes necessary to take those out. And so these, these what they do is um, you uh, have a have a the uranium in the middle, and you have a blanket of thorium around the outside. As the thorium picks up uranium, you take it out, reprocess it, put it in the center, and and keep going. You can also, um, and so that's the, and this is. So you, so um, this also, it's radioactive, so it would all have to be handled remotely and everything, just like reprocessing. What is commonly um, talked about is the molten salt reactors. They um, use a, they're completely different from what is used in power plants today, and they're what most of these articles are about. What they use is they use uranium salts as both the um, primary coolant in the core and the fuel. And one thing about them is they're operating at, at, they're not at the high pressures of a PWR, and they, um, and they, um, um, and they operate at high temperature. And so they, and, and here's a schematic of one. You have the core here, and you have the, uh, the uh, fluid, the, um, the, um, the fuel flowing through the core, and instead of the core being a solid, it's, it's a fluid. So it flows through a heat exchanger, and then you have a secondary um, fluid which you go out to the generators. And this has some unique things about it, which are potential advantages. You can have an inline chemical processing plant, which um, can remove fission products, so you increase the, decrease the number of um, parasitical absorbers in the fuel. You can also have um, things where they are, uh, they, uh, and so you keep it going. And you can uh, have the, uh, all the, so, you'd, so it'd be, the thorium would be bred in the reactor and it just circulates around and keep, and um, so you, you never have to stop it and refuel it because you can just process the fuel that is in there without stopping the reaction. And one unique feature is if this reactor ever gets too hot, you have a, you have a freeze plug at the bottom, and it, it melts, and, um, and uh, the fluid in the reactor falls by gravity into the tanks where they're subcritical, and they just sit there, and everything is, and everybody's happy. Um, they have, there's been one um, really major molten salt reactor experiment in the United States. It was in Oak Ridge National Laboratory in 1965 to 1969. This was the fuel that used uranium as a fuel. And um, it was a 7.4 megawatt thermal reactor with a temperature of about 650 degrees C. Here's a schematic of the, um, of the reactor. You had the core in the middle. and they just were, since this was experimental, the core just was, went out and it was to a cooling thing. And there was the pumps and everything. One thing about this, this sort of reactor is, when the major disadvantage is you're dealing with very, this isn't very nice stuff, so you have to have very corrosive resistant materials in order for it to, to not plug up the pumps and everything. And, they, but they managed to get it to work for about four years, I, and they 
managed to solve most of these problems. And then at the end of that time, they, um, I guess for a variety of reasons, they decided not to take the next step, which was to um, build one that actually was hooked bigger and hooked to a generator. And they op but they operated with uranium-235. And then at the end of the experiment, they took that all out and used uranium-233 to run it. It was not big enough to, um, to actually breed with. Their, their um, plan was you have, uh, you have uh, let's see, I think this, this is a more modern design, I think. Yes. Or, no, this one, it doesn't show it. But what you have is you have, would have a um, central core. You'd have essentially a two-loop thing where you had the central core had the fuel in it, and you had another molten salt flowing around it, which contained the thorium. And so the reaction was going on in the middle. You're creating more uranium on the outside. And um, you would, in this way, there's their separate, and then you chemically can put them into the, you can put them into the reaction, into the reactor together and, and keep going. So it's a nice continuous thing. One nice thing it had is it had a, um, if you go back to this previous slide, it, at some point in the reactor they would have a um, place at the top where they'd, it's one of the primary fission products in the reactor is xenon-135. It's got a humongous cross-section. And so in order to make the reactor more efficient, they would, um, they would um, put this sort of sparge, this liquid through a port at the top, and they could get rid of the, high, the xenon gas very effectively. And so they didn't have to deal with it. And so it's a very nice thing. Here is a picture of the inside of it from the top. You have the core, the pump, and all the piping. Um, here is a picture of the core. It was a thermal reactor, and its moderation was graphite. So you just flow the, re the, um, the fluid through this graphite core, and the graphite serves as a moderator, and, and, it, worked, and it worked very well, I guess. Um, there's the, about the nuclear waste problem, I, I decided instead of showing the, the uh, plots and everything, to just, this is not really a very major problem, because if you calculate the amount of nuclear waste that would be generated if, every, if using current technology, if every American got all their energy, the energy that you use in your cars, everything, from nuclear power, you, gener you generate eight kilograms of radioactive waste in your lifetime. This would fit in a quart jar. And when you die, we could just bury it with you, <laughs> and nobody would notice. And, um, and of course, you wouldn't want to bury it with the people because it's actually um, potentially valuable. So the best plot plan is to keep them um, to store it someplace nice so you can get to it, like the parking lot where they put them now. Um, so if you're going to complain about this, we really ought to look at another problem. The average human being produces about two to four pounds of potentially toxic waste every day. And this is, believe it or not, processed and the effluent put in the rivers. And it's estimated from what I can read on the internet, that this kills, that because you have to contain this, it kills about 500,000 children a year from diarrheal illnesses. So um, maybe we should be using nuclear power to get ourselves some energy to build nuclear sewage, sewage treatment plants in third world countries, rather than um, worrying about nuclear waste. So um, here's the summary of the, of the thorium's advertised advantages. It's true that we have more raw material, but for the foreseeable future, there is plenty of uranium. So it's not really that big a deal. It can't melt down, but this nucle nuclear plants are so safe already that you're, you're dealing with an unknown technology. Who knows what the problems will be? It's a very, very hard to tell it, to make a comparison at that level. Less waste is really not an issue. Harder to make nuclear weapons, yes, but the materials would have to be handled remotely. So this is very nice. I could give a long dissertation about how we should switch to thorium fuel, 
but the problem is you can't tell. Um, believe it or not, the electric car was popular before the gasoline car. Um, Edison invented had an electric car he was running around with, and then Ford came to him, I guess, and said that I have an idea on how to build an a gasoline car. You can see the elect his electric car is in Fort Myers, Florida, if you want to see an example of it. And um, he said, that's great, go out and see if you can build one. And so, of course, the gasoline car was better than the electric car, though on paper we could probably both if you didn't know anything about them, you could probably make nice arguments for either one. And at the same time, of course, we had the steam car. But now, in today's current environment, you cannot have a fair competition because just to make a slightly different reactor of the same type as they've been building for 50 years, it's going to take 15 years of dealings with the NRC if they can get it approved. So the only way to know whether thorium is a better fuel cycle than uranium is to get out of the way and let somebody try it. And, and that is my um, summary and I'd be happy to have questions. I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience who know a lot more about this than me, so if they can I'd be happy to have questions. Yes, it's a very good presentation. You didn't describe um, very carefully why there's no problem with meltdown. Where oh. is your ultimate heat sink? Uh, how, where does it come from? Oh, okay. The reason it can't melt down is because it's already melted. Yeah, I realize that, but uh, so, and it so still keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter and, and hotter then, unless you remove the heat. Well, so then what you do is you, it goes down into this, into the dump tanks, which are presumably in a geometrical arrangement, so they're not critical, and you have some sort of convection cooling, maybe you have a nice pool of water around that would... You have to conduct it into the ground, or into the lake, or into the air, it has to go somewhere. Yes, it has to the go The heat keeps being produced for thousands of years. Yes, but it's not as very much heat. Okay, so... You do have a problem, though, but you have to have a good heat sink. That's correct. That's right. I'm glad you made the point that uh, the resource base of uranium or thorium doesn't really matter because we got plenty of both, and we really don't know how much we have of either. We know we have more than more thorium than uranium, but in practical terms, that may be immaterial. Um, one question, the Indians have been working on thorium reactors for quite a while. Can you tell us something about where they might be now and when they might actually build the first thorium reactor? Um, well, they have a lot of reactors. They have um, it's about six or eight, I think, uh, pressurized heavy water reactors, which can be used to breed thorium. And they're, they're working on getting their fuel cycle going with that. This. They've been working on this for a long time. But where, where is their research on this? Do you know anything about that? I do not know much about okay. their um, research, no. The Indians, uh, they use a can-do type reactor, as you pointed out, heavy water reactor, and uh, we use uh, depleted uranium in a reactor when it starts up to depress the flux so that we can get a, a nice operating reactor until it gets to uh, equilibrium state where you have your fission products there. The Indians put in thorium instead of depleted uranium and they, they get the, the same effect with that. They've also developed fuel cycles where they put in natural uranium and thorium as well. And they have fueling engineers who have optimized how they use thorium. So they, they are using it. Um, the, the thing we have to get to is, is to a breeder reactor where we separate the fission products and recycle the uranium-233. So that needs processing, and uh, there are many methods of reprocessing uh, 
the, the Americans have developed the IFR reactor, an integral fast reactor in Chicago at Argonne Labs. And they use um, pyroprocessing to separate the fission products from the fuel and they can recycle it. And currently we only use a few percent of the uranium uh, for fuel. But if we started recycling the fuel, uh, we'd get the other 98%. So the numbers you give for the amount of energy, uh, it's actually 100, well, 50 times more yes. than what you've, uh, the numbers you've given. Yeah, that's right. But that's so we have to get to closing the fuel cycle and to uh, reprocessing it. We have the technology, but are there barriers? Yes, that's right. As correct. you know, but what we, we can't uh, get permission or funding or whatever to, to get that started. Matthew, from a, from a practical standpoint, you had mentioned uh, that um, the thorium reactor that they built was too small to demonstrate completely your, uh, the practicality of it. Do you have a feel for how big does it have to be before you can say, yeah, this will work fine? Or could you clear that up for me? Okay, I think the next reactor they were planning to build was about 100 megawatts. I'm, I, it was a little while since I read the report. And they were, and they were going to have a, the initial um, uh, they were going to have the secondary fluid. I think you could do it just fine with this, too, if you put a re reflectors and things around, too. You could probably make it as small as you wanted. Thank you very much.